Uh, good morning. I understand that I'm uh, fighting with coffee outside, right? That we, we got coffee and tea in our hands, and they immediately begin ringing the bell. Uh, choose coffee over me as well. So uh, uh, I am, I'm speaking to either people who are wide awake or not very thirsty right now. And so I welcome you. Um, so much of what appeals to me about HTML5 is how broadly applicable this technology is. When I was talking about mobile OSs yesterday, I was talking about how this isn't just an Android iOS world, although right now that represents over 92% of the market. But rather than focusing on the differences between those platforms, I look at them as nearly identical platforms because I am an HTML5 developer. If I were a Java developer, I would say, oh, I wish I could write programs for iOS, but I can't. My dear friend Daniel Steinberg and Ben are iOS developers, and they say, ah, oh, we would love to program for Android, but we're Objective-C developers, not Java developers. So it really depends on where you sit and where your perspective is. That we can look at those two platforms, Android and iOS as very different platforms, or as an HTML5 developer, I look at them as very similar platforms. And when we talk about the other operating systems that are going to join us next year, whether it's Tizen, whether it's Firefox OS, whether it's Web OS, whether it's Ubuntu Touch, you can look at those platforms as very different from different vendors and different libraries and different languages, or you can look at HTML5 as the unifying technology that will allow me to develop the same app for everyone of those different platforms. The reason I'm lingering here on this idea, I notice I haven't even gotten past my opening slide yet, is it's very important for us to recognize what I'm gonna talk about right now. What I'm gonna talk about right now is very specifically the new HTML5 issues, excuse me, uh, features, that came out with iOS 7 just several weeks ago. So what I'm going to demonstrate for you here right now is very explicitly technology that will not work on your Android phones and will not work on your WebOS phones and will not work on your Tizen and Firefox OS phones. And so you can look at something like that and say, aha, see, it's just like the bad old days. How many of you have been doing web development for five years or more. How many of you have been web developers for over five years? Ah, very good. How many of you have been web developers for over 10 years? Yeah? 15 years? Were any of you doing web development back in the early days, 1995, 1996? Any of you doing web development back then? Oh, you make me feel very old. Ah. Oh. I remember writing original software, courseware, talking about the web. I said, the web is going to be an amazing thing. Someday we're going to be able to order pizza on the internet. And everyone said, ah, oh, that'll never work. You'll never be able to do that. And now look, we're in an era of Amazon where we can order refrigerators on the internet and they show up on our doorsteps. But while the early web, the 1996 web, was full of promise, it was also the bad old days of web development. Because those were the days when browser vendors thought that it was a zero-sum game. You familiar with that zero-sum game? It means they thought one person could own the entire internet. And the reason they thought that is because Netscape Navigator in 1996 had a 92% market share. It, in fact, did own the Internet. And so with great power comes great responsibility. And as we're learning in the United States, sometimes politicians can handle the responsibility, and sometimes they can't. And Netscape Navigator couldn't handle the responsibility. Back when they owned 92% of the market, they said, we're going to introduce our own elements. 
and our own JavaScript libraries and our own CSS styles that were incompatible with all the other browsers at the time. That was good for Netscape, but bad for us as a community. And so you would think that Microsoft with Internet Explorer, the young upstart, would have learned from that. But in fact, they learned the same behavior that Netscape did. So over the next two years, as their fortunes reversed, and as Internet Explorer got a 95% market share, what did Microsoft start doing? Exactly what Netscape did. They started adding their own elements, their own tags, their own JavaScript rules, their own CSS styles. So the early days of the web were the days of the two most popular browsers running as fast as they could away from each other. That was the era of this website best viewed in Internet Explorer. This website best viewed in Netscape Navigator. Do you want to go back to those days? I certainly don't. And yet it looks like that's what I'm going to be talking about right now. It looks like I'm going to be talking about features that only work in one browser. But the reason I am spending this excruciatingly long time, I promise you I'm going to show you lots of source code. I'm not going to be hand-waving the entire time over my opening slide. But it is crucial that you understand that the reason I am showing you this, the reason I'm showing you these features that literally only work in one browser on the planet right now, is because these are not mobile Safari features. These are HTML5 features. What I am giving you right now is a glimpse of the future. It is the first browser that has implemented these features. It will not be the last. And so what you're getting to see right now is real working code. But here we are almost 20 years later from the birth of the web, and now we don't have browser manufacturers running as fast as they could away from each other. We have them running as quickly as they can towards a common goal. The way browser manufacturers compete now is they argue that we offer the fullest HTML5 implementation. We offer the fastest HTML5 implementation. We offer the best HTML5 implementation. And so what I'm offering you right now is what is arguably the leading edge browser on the web right now, which is Mobile Safari. And that's a bold claim because it doesn't have the biggest market share. We learned that yesterday. Android has 80% of the market, but it only represents a quarter of the web traffic. Mobile Safari, iOS, represents 13% of the market, but represents well over half of the web traffic because it is an innovative browser. And so what I'm going to show you here in Mobile Safari is going to end up in Desktop Safari. It's going to end up in Chrome. It's going to end up in Firefox. It's going to end up in, yes, even Internet Explorer. So even though this title slide, and by the way, I'm just about ready to move on. How long have we been sitting on this slide? Almost 10 minutes. Are you tired of looking at it? I certainly am. But I really hope that I've made my point that even though this talk is about specifically HTML5 features that are only available in iOS 7 today, the important part of that slide is not the iOS 7 part. The important part is the HTML5 part. And what you are going to see is a glimpse of the future. These features as they exist right now are the features that are going to be in your browser next week or next month or certainly next year. Because once one browser manufacturer has provided implementation, every other browser manufacturer on the planet has new incentives has now have a fire lit under them saying, well, if they can do it, we need to do it as well. And we need to do it better, and we need to do it more performant. So, is it okay for me to move on to the next slide now? I don't want to rush anyone. Yeah? Okay. So what you're seeing right now is a glimpse of the future, but this is executable 
documentation. There are lots of new features out there, but I am only going to show you the ones that work. So, that said, here's what we're going to talk about. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's a representative list of what some of the new features are. We're going to look at some new elements in HTML5, like the progress element like seamless iframes, like bringing closed captioning to video tracks. We'll show you ways that you can begin capturing camera input from your users. Whenever I am looking at the difference between native development and Objective-C for iOS or Java for Android, whenever I'm comparing and contrasting a native option to a web option, it always boils down to features. What can I do? And for the longest time, it used to be, well, if I needed to have camera input, I'd need to write a native app. Now they've exposed it out through a simple file input tag. So we'll get an opportunity to see that. We'll also focus on some of the new CSS3 features. Uh, this is not exhaustive by any stretch. But there are some really nice, nice-to-have kind of features. And then we'll let, leave off talking about some of the new JavaScript APIs. Page visibility is fun. AirPlay. If you enjoy this AirPlay, remember I've got an entire 60 minutes dedicated to smartphones and smart TVs and the integration of those. That's the very last slot today. But this web speech synthesis, even though it's kind of silly, is a fun demo to end with because your phone will literally start talking back to you instead of you talking to it all the time. So we have a lot of code to show. Like, unlike my other talks here, rather than me doing a lot of hand waving, I'm going to be doing a lot of running code. So let's start running. The first thing I want to demonstrate is a progress element. Now, this is not life-changing. This is not going to want to make you, as Daniel said earlier, quit your job and become a mobile HTML5 developer just because finally we have a progress element. But what's nice about this progress element is it really begins demonstrating what the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, has in mind is really HTML5, these new elements, are about semantics. And I'm not talking capital S semantic web like griddle and triples and things like that. I'm talking about lowercase s semantics. But what that really means is elements mean what they say and say what they mean. We have some wonderful generic elements like div and span. But if I look at a div, that doesn't tell me intrinsically what's inside of that element. But if I look at a paragraph, I know. If I look at an H1, I know. Header 1, header 2, header 3. You see the semantics that are surrounding this? So with HTML5, there are a number of new semantic elements like article. What do you think is in an article uh, block? Well, article. What's a section? Well, it's a section. What's a nav? Well, it's navigation. So when we look at progress, yes, you get some fun little blue bars across the screen. But what's more important is this is a new semantic element. When you look at a progress bar in your markup, you know exactly what that's trying to represent. Progress. So let's come in and take a look at what that progress bar looks like. Now, I'm in an iPhone emulator right now. I'm going to spend a lot of time kind of bouncing between desktop browsers and my emulator here. My, I could use the emulator or I could all just have us gather around this screen. Which would you prefer? Yeah? All right. We'll use the emulator as it goes along here. So this status element is just what it ends up looking like. If you're on step three, you're this far in the progress. If you're on step two, you're this far into the process. If you're on step three, that you're done. You can see that there are very slight styling differences between desktop Safari and mobile Safari. One of the things you might notice is while I'm in progress, there's this kind of pulsing motion as it goes along. So step one, step two, step three, it's a solid bar. This is on the desktop. And what's nice is I've got another browser up here right now. This is Chrome. And we can see that Chrome, even though it's not identical 
to safari. It's certainly close. It's certainly close. So what does the source code end up looking like? Well, here we are. We're in this progress bar right here. This is the progress element itself. And you can see more than anything else, you can give it a max and a current value. So if you want to measure progress in your app, you can turn around and throw a progress element. All of these buttons now, all they're doing is simply calling a JavaScript method show progress that gets that element and tweaks the value. So even though I've slowed it down so we can see what that looks like by hand, you could imagine having a file download process or a file upload process or a wizard or any number of things where all we want to do is just demonstrate progress in an app. Does that make sense? Yeah? Outstanding. There are a number of different HTML form elements that we'll see as we go along there. Progress is not where we're ending. Progress is just where we're beginning. So let's talk about iframes next. Iframes are kind of interesting because when we started doing web development, it was all about a single page mentality. We would make an HTTP GET request and we would download an entire page. Now, when the Ajax revolution came on, about 2005 or so, we said, hey, you know what? Instead of doing these coarse-grained request responses, we can do micro-request responses. We can leave the entire page in place and make a bunch of little mini-requests and update them. That was one way to accomplish this. You would typically make an Ajax request and then paint that data into another div somewhere. But another way you could get the same thing, the another way you could begin aggregating pages is by using iframes. Now, we're not talking about frames like in the bad old days of the 1996s where we had completely separate frames. That's actually been deprecated by the W3C. But iframes have not. These are internal frames. And the idea, once again, is I've got two pages, two complete separate HTML pages. But if I load this page in an iframe, it will show up inside of that second page. Now, you can imagine when you're merging two entire pages together, that might cause some issues. What happens if page two loads some JavaScript libraries that conflict with page one? What happens if page two has different CSS styling rules than this. You can see how those are legitimate issues. And since they're both standalone HTML pages, it's hard to figure out which parts you want to merge and which parts you want to keep separate. So when they introduce this idea of seamless iframes, what I'm going to show you is it's going to look like it was just a cosmetic difference. If you have a normal iframe, it's going to show up with a visible border and scroll bars. You could certainly get rid of all those with CSS styling. The idea between, behind a seamless iframe is that it's really meant to merge those two pages together in a more holistic way. If I talk about parent and child, I'm just speaking metaphorically. Those aren't iframe terms. But if I have a parent page and I load a seamless iframe inside of that, that child page is really meant to inherit the CSS and the JavaScript and the behavior of that parent document. So even though I'm going to show you the physical differences, it's the semantic difference that's really important. By making a seamless iframe, it's meant to inherit all of the behaviors and characteristics and stylings of the parent page. And the reason why this is so important, are there more and more apps that are using iframes and specifically seamless iframes, to seamlessly blend themselves together with your website. Discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S, is a wonderful service out there. Talk about a highly cohesive, loosely coupled service. Discuss is just about threaded discussions like this. It's really meant for you to manage comments on a blog or comments on a product page or something like that. So the idea is this service ought to be blended seamlessly with your page. 
Disgust doesn't want to have their own look and feel. They want to blend in with your look and feel. So if you are using the restful APIs of Disgust, you in fact are using iframes under the covers because they're merging that whole comment thread with your page. Does that make sense? Do you get the idea that I am going to show you one-liner codes and spend five or ten minutes discussing those one-liner codes? All right, I just wanted to make sure there are no surprises. That's exactly what you have to look forward to for the rest of this presentation. So let's come in here real quick, and let's look at this iframe when it's not so seamless to begin with. So the idea here is I've got one page, and I've loaded iframe 2 right in the middle. This is how it looks on a phone, but it's even more obvious when we come in here and look at it in a browser. We can see that it, we get this kind of scroll bar effect in here. These are two separate pages. And again, if you really want to see this in action here, you can see that I've got before the iframe, after the iframe, and then I load up iframe 2 in the middle. So once again, before the iframe, after the iframe, and that separate page in the middle. Yeah? So that's what a normal iframe out of the box looks like. If I turn around and just add one attribute like this, seamless, that's going to change the look and feel, but more importantly, it's going to change the semantics. Now, down here, we begin seeing that, yeah, that scroll bar is still there. I could use CSS to make it go away. But in the context of an iPhone, when I use that seamless tag in there, we can see more than just having those borders go away. It really has semantically merged those two pages together. And so on the iPhone, I couldn't tell that those are actually made up of separate pages. Can you see how seamless iframes are their own request response cycle, but in terms of the view, they've merged those together? A lot of times we look to frameworks like Rails or Grails or Node.js uh, to do templating, to start having little bits of headers and footers and things that we can merge together. We do that in Ruby or Groovy or JavaScript on the server side traditionally. This is a way we can begin seamlessly merging those snippets, those partials together in the client side, just through iframe seamless. Make sense? Excellent. Video captions. Now, HTML5 video itself is well established. Any of these major video providers are not just walking. They are running towards HTML5 as a video solution. YouTube is actively running towards HTML5 video as a solution as opposed to Flash which is what they've historically used. And the reason they're running towards HTML5 is we know that Flash doesn't run on mobile devices. I can't run Flash on iPhones and Androids, not because Flash is a bad format, but because Flash is a video codec that's implemented in software instead of hardware. MPEG is a standard that is so ubiquitous that they have dedicated MPEG chips that you can solder onto the motherboard. If you have an MPEG chip codec, you can get 10 hours of battery life out of your mobile devices as you're watching videos because it's hardware, it's silicon, it's highly optimized. If you're trying to do the exact same work, but you're trying to do it in software, you're trying to focus on the CPU, no exaggeration, you get about 42 minutes of battery life as opposed to 10 hours. So this HTML5 video element is replacing Flash in the case of YouTube. It's replacing Silverlight in the case of Netflix. All of our major video providers are moving towards HTML5 video. But what we have to realize is it's more than just showing stuff on the screen. A lot of the innovations are what are going on when I'm watching a video in a room like this where I have Wi-Fi, a nice fast bandwidth, and then I walk out the door and I flip over to the cellular market. So the existing HTML element solves those problems by allowing us to serve up different video 
different bandwidth, different codecs. But another thing they've begun to address now is accessibility. Being able to layer in captions, being able to layer in uh, text overlays, um, being able to intersperse advertisements. I'm not going to talk about that. But I do want to talk about this new way to introduce subtitles. So I'll show you a bigger example in just a moment here, but video supports a bunch of embedded sources so you can deal with different codecs, but it also now introduces a track element. And that track can be subtitles or captions or descriptions or chapters or just generic metadata, but you begin seeing now that I could download the video and have a German soundtrack or a French soundtrack or a Hindi soundtrack or an English soundtrack. I can also do the same thing with subtitles. So if we come in here and take a look at how video oh really? Oh that's the joy of emulators. They just recently updated this emulator and um, um, it's not uh, behaving quite as solidly as I would like. But if we come in and take a look at a video like this, when I begin playing it, all right, when I begin playing it, you're going to hear sound, but I want you to pay attention to the closed captioning. So there's a subtle but important, we can let this play, I can talk over this. There's a subtle but important difference between closed captioning and subtitles. Closed captioning tends to be English, French, German, linguistic kind of differences. Captioning like this is something where most smart TVs, if you pause them, automatically turn on captions so you can hear the music playing, the laughter, things like that. So that's why there are two subtle differences between captions and subtitles. But let's turn around. I'm sorry, were you watching that? Yeah? All right. There's always more interesting things than me. That won't hurt my feelings. But if we come in here and look at this video... We can see that the video gives me the ability to have a poster that has me some kind of opening screenshot. That's my poster right there. I can have various sources. I'm serving up both an MPEG-4 and a WebM. These are different codecs. Certain browsers understand MPEG, certain ones understand WebM. Some of them understand WV, uh, WVM, those things like that. But here's that track in there. And this track uses a very specific file format, the VTT format. And if we go in and take a look at that, this is all it is, is a series of timestamps with the text that you want to see right next to it. So all of a sudden, I'm not having to play around with embedding this stuff in binary. I've got a simple sidecar. I have simple metadata here. Hello, is it raining outside or is it sunny? Is it sunny? All right. Hello, sunny Bangalore in 2013. So all of a sudden now, I've specified a caption that's going to show up between one and six seconds in this video. So by doing something as simple as this, I'm going to come in and refresh and play once again. We see how easy that is. Now, each one of these tracks can have a source language attribute associated with them. So just like we can easily manage multiple video formats, we can just as easily manage multiple languages by applying a source lang attribute to those. And so whatever language your browser reports up, it will then begin playing that set of captions. Does that make sense? It's fun seeing the sophistication that we can add with a single element. 
So I mentioned that camera access historically was something that would lead me to use native development rather than HTML5 development. I said yesterday that I'm really excited for Firefox OS. And I really enjoyed the presentation yesterday afternoon. Who, who, were, who was there for the, H, the, the Firefox OS development? He did a really nice job up there, didn't he? Yeah. And so what I like about that is even if Firefox OS never gets 80% of the market like Android does, they are going to do a wonderful job of pushing HTML5 state-of-the-art forward. I still think that Firefox OS is going to be a profoundly influential mobile operating system, even if it doesn't have the market share of an Android. And so something like this is absolutely something they're going to want to push. They're going to want to give us more and more capabilities in HTML5. And what you have to realize is this is a very common pattern. Again, if you come and hear my smart TVs talk this evening, you're going to find that every one of the smart TVs offers a JavaScript API a JavaScript API to do channel up and channel down and volume and all kinds of things like that. But what the TV actually does is provide you a JavaScript interface to really what's like a Linux or a C library under the covers. Most all of our smart TVs are Linux boxes under the covers with dual and quad core processors. And so the volume and the channel and things like that are all C libraries that are driving the hardware itself. But these SDKs provide us a JavaScript interface that binds to that C library under the covers. This is very similar in spirit to that. The reason why I would normally need to do native development is Apple has provided me a set of Objective-C libraries or modules that allow me to control the camera. Android has provided me a different set of Java libraries to control the camera there. What I can do in HTML5 is use a common element, and then each one of the browsers polymorphically binds to the appropriate binary under the covers. Polymorphism, a wonderful term, isn't it? Latin for many morphs? Close. Latin for many sizes, or many shapes, or many implementations. So as a Java developer, when I talk about polymorphism, I talk about programming to an interface, not an implementation. As an HTML5 developer, it's almost always what I'm talking about. I'm going to write to the HTML5 interface and know that each browser is going to polymorphically bind to whatever the appropriate libraries are under the covers. So in my emulator, when I come in and I want to interact with the camera, my emulator is really just a skinned version of desktop Safari. This is why I travel everywhere with an iPhone and an Android and a Lumia phone and different things, because there is no replacement for running actual software on actual hardware. So knowing that this emulator is simply a skinned version of desktop Safari, when I go and choose the file here, I'm going to get basically desktop Safari behavior, which is going to allow me to pull up existing images. And by the way, if I come over here real quick and show you what that image is. We were laughing at geek humor on the drive over this morning. And this is one of my favorite images of recent memory. It's OK to laugh. <laughs> Every programmer has lived through that, right? Would we'll ask them for estimates and then treat them as deadlines. <laughs> so at any rate, this is my image that I'm using here. You can see that on a desktop browser, it's allowing me to go in and choose that image. On a smartphone, it's emulating that right now because I'm really using desktop Safari. But if I were showing you this on the actual phone, what it would pop up is a screen that ends up looking like this. So not only could I choose an existing image, I could take a new photo. Now let me be very clear that all I am doing in order to accomplish this is using an input type equals file. 
But when we're talking about how these different browsers polymorphically treat that same element, we'll find that desktop browsers, when you say input type equals file, they're going to pull up a file chooser. They're like, oh, well, you told me semantically you want to insert a file, and so I'm going to give the ability to do that. On a phone, though, especially in iOS, they don't expose the file system out to you. So what they will do is they will expose out a photo chooser or a video chooser. And in the case on the phone, they'll actually give you the ability to snap a new photo as well. Now, you will notice that I also have gained the ability to limit the type of files that I want. These MIME types um, are what drive this, not file extensions. So when I say I want to be able to load anything of an image type or anything of a video type, the way that's going to manifest is when I come in here right now and I say I want to choose a file, you'll see that I can choose images, but I can't choose non-image files. Those non-image files are absolutely blocked from me because I've set on that input type that I want to be able to import an image type. Now, if I come in here and choose a video, you're going to see just the opposite has happened. I can't choose images. I can only choose movies. And <laughs> in this case, Safari won't let me choose the movie. But I think Chrome won't let me down, right? Chrome, do you believe me? Are you with me on this? There we go. So Chrome understands. So this is really interesting once again that in context, I'm mixing up MIME types with the file type and my browsers are polymorphically doing the right thing. What's really nice as well is that you can also say input type equals file multiple and then you can multi-tap your way through. Again, I wish I could demonstrate that for you right now, but I can't through the emulator. You'll have to trust me that it works well on the phone. So, the last element I want to show you here before we get into the CSS and the JavaScript is being able to do this kind of thing. Promote your app in the App Store. And a lot of times, the organizations I'm dealing with, they say, well, I know you're an HTML5 guy, Scott, but we already have an app. Well, that's fine, but you have to realize there's a lot of friction in terms of installing apps from the App Store. You have to click, it launches a new app, you have to download it, you might have to provide a password, and then you're constantly getting nagged to update it and update it, update it. That's my favorite new feature of iOS 7, by the way. Having it auto-updates all those apps behind the scenes, that's really nice. But just the fact that you have an app doesn't mean that you shouldn't offer a good responsive web design as well because you don't get to choose how your clients want to visit you. Some of them might want to use a browser interface. Someone might want to choose an app. So the best thing you can do is offer them the best of both worlds. And so what Apple has given us the ability to do is provide a consistent, standardized way to provide a little badge like that. So on a desktop, you can provide a magic link that would turn around and allow you to click th directly through to that app and be able to download it. Now, what browser did I did this in? Uh, I did it in Chrome, and I don't have internet. So how's that for a double whammy, huh? But if I do that on a phone, what we're going to see is that nice banner pop up there. Oh, and due to my internet connectivity, you get a nice empty banner. How does that look? Is that lovely? Okay, now it's even better looking, isn't it? But you can see that if I were on a real network with real connectivity, that would pop up a real banner. And that banner is quite literally, quite literally, where are we at? I'm blind, I'm blind. Here we go, app link. Quite literally, a one-liner. So what should have popped up there was a nice banner for the Dig mobile app in the App Store. And I've provided it as metadata. 
giving it a, a display name, and then more importantly, that app's ID in the app store. So I am deferring all of the behavior, all the look and feel to the browser. I'm just providing additional semantics to the web page, saying, oh, by the way, this web page has a corresponding app, and I will let the browser defer the details, display the details as the browser sees fit. Does that make sense? All right. So, those are the new HTML5 elements, and it's not exhaustive by any stretch, but the overriding theme right there is we wanted to provide semantics. Whether it's progress elements, whether it's file inputs, all of those kinds of things, we wanted to let the browser do the right thing because we're saying what we mean and mean what we say. When we start looking at these CSS elements, you know that we typically think of CSS being kind of look and feel issues, like fonts and colors and rounded corners and things like that. CSS is getting increasingly sophisticated for complex layouts as well. We've been able to do scrolling the viewport. You can make it sticky. Now, this is a great example of how different browsers are going to polymorphically treat this differently. Desktop browsers, I have an embarrassment of riches. I have great big screens, and so this sticky tag is actually going to be ignored by desktop browsers. Now, they'll get around to implementing it eventually, but this is a much more pressing need on small devices with tiny screens. When I have smaller viewports, I need to keep elements visible longer, do more with less. So if I come in here, oh, there it finally came up, Plants vs. Zombies 2. That's a fun game, by the way. I've lost hours, days of my life to that blasted game. So if I come in here and start looking at sticky positioning right now, we can see that I've got a header up there, but as I scroll around, it kind of goes away. That's really not a big deal on a desktop, but on a phone, it could be a huge usability issue if as I'm scrolling things, that header disappeared. So you can see the reason that header is sticking around is because I have literally added a single directive WebKit sticky. What happens if I turn that off? Come in here right now, and that header goes away. So again, this is one of those features that's implemented today on iOS 7 because it's scratching a real itch, a real need on these mobile devices. There is no good reason why this shouldn't be implemented on desktops. And again, eventually it will be. But this is a feature that was introduced on a mobile platform, and it will disseminate from there. Not life-changing, but on a mobile device, really nice to have. This, hopefully, will be a lot more impressive. You let me know. But so many times, we have to make the structure of our document match the look and feel of our document. And what I mean is this. If I wanted to go in... and display some columns of text. This is how my text looks right now, with discrete paragraphs. And if I show you the HTML, I don't think you're going to be the least bit surprised. There's a paragraph that begins with bacon. There's another one with ham. There's another one with drumstick and pork. By the way, are you familiar with lorem ipsum? Lorem ipsum is a bunch of fake Latin that you use just to fill up. I'm a big fan of bacon ipsum. If you Google that, there's a website out there called bacon ipsum, and you tell it how many paragraphs you want. I had it auto-generate five paragraphs of meat. So all I wanted to show you right here is with one line in there, by coming in and saying, I want this to be three columns, I can come in and have something like that transformed into something like this. Would you like to applaud? You can. That is incredible. 
And that is the perfect difference between models and views. I say over and over again that you should start thinking of your HTML as pure semantic, as pure data, and your CSS should handle look and feel issues. Historically, we would have had to break this into divs, and then what if all of a sudden we got a new user requirement? They said, no, it needs to be four columns, not three. If you are having model deal with look and feel issues, it wouldn't be that easy. And we can see that these logically flow as I resize my document as well. So the idea behind this one-liner approach is to let each part of the puzzle do its appropriate information. If HTML is now all about the semantic elements, CSS is truly about look and feel issues. And so I ought to be able to say that div should be two columns or three or 12. Image set is another thing that's interesting. And again, this really applies to uh, iOS devices because they typically have the highest resolution retina display is what they called it. That was the brand name. And it was a really nice brand name because not only does it sound cool, they're saying that the pixels are packed so densely on the screen that if we did even more, it wouldn't be worth it because your eyes couldn't discern the difference. So what they're talking about is really nice high resolution stuff. Well, if you've spent time between retina display and non-retina display, you know that that pixel doubling can make all of your old images look really awful on the new device. Similarly, if you send down those new images to a device that can't handle it, it makes your images freakishly large. So we're not talking about the physical dimensions of the image. We're talking about the pixel depth. And that's been something that we haven't had the language to deal with. You've heard of confirmation bias, which means if you hold a deeply held political or religious belief, all evidence that comes in that supports your belief, you say, well, of course. See, I told you. And if anything comes in that disagrees with your belief, you say, nah, that can't be the truth. But we're not talking about confirmation bias here. We're talking about language bias. Sometimes you don't literally have the language or the words to describe what you're trying to accomplish. And retina display is a great example of that. This is a new problem that came out on the web, not even back in 2007. It came out just several iterations ago where we have high-density devices and low-density devices. And so what we need is new language to describe those differences. Differences. And so what we have now is the ability in CSS to provide a 1x image and a 2x image right there. And what I love about this syntax is that it means what it says, and it says what it means. I can glance at that, and it's a one-liner, and it makes perfect sense to me that this is my low-res image and this is my high-res image. Now, one of the things that you'll get out of this in addition to semantics is it gives me an opportunity to talk about this vendor prefixing. All of these CSS st styles that I've shown you right now have begun with WebKit. WebKit image set, WebKit column count, WebKit sticky. That's semantic as well. That's telling me that this is the render kit, this is the render engine that supports it right now. But what happens is when Mozilla decides they want to implement this, they're going to do an MZ hyphen. And when Microsoft decides to do it, they're going to do an MS hyphen. When Opera decides to do it, they're going to do an O hyphen. And eventually, when enough of these browsers have implemented it, literally the W3C waits for two or three consistent implementations before they will standardize that. So WebKit right now lets me know that this is an early leading stage feature. But when I see a WebKit and a Blink and an MS and an O in there, all those different vendor prefixes, eventually the W3C is going to allow us to drop those vendor prefixes and just treat these as sticky, as columns, and as image sets. 
So even though this is a problem that's unique to iOS right now, it's certainly going to wake its way into the mainstream. So the remaining time I have, I want to show you a couple of new JavaScript libraries as well. And if our HTML is all about semantic elements, if our CSS is all about look and feel, then JavaScript is all about behavior. It's the controller of our MVC triad here. And so these are the kinds of things in JavaScript that we want to be able to deal with. But you're going to see that what these really are are reactive libraries. These are events that we can set up to listen on, like page visibility. If you have a single tabbed browser, then you're not concerned about clicking among tabs. But the minute you introduce tabs, you might say to yourself, wait a second, if I've got a game running in this tab, and it's pegging my CPU, and I click on another tab, what do I want to happen to that game? Do I want it to pause? Do I want it to keep grinding in the background? I now have a JavaScript API that allows me to listen on these events and react appropriately. So if I come back in here right now to my phone and I look at the page visibility API, there's nothing going on right now because, well, I'm on the page. What I want to listen on is an event where I click off of that page and go somewhere else. Let me try to go to Apple. Let's see if the Internet gods are smiling on me right now. Oh, I might actually get something. Holy cow, would you look at that. But now when I come back to my page visibility... <laughs> the, the internet gods are happy with me, but the demo gods are very, very unhappy with me right now. What we were expecting to see out of this is when I click off of this tab and click back in, all right, let me show you the source code of this code that's not working. The, oh, that's why, that's page visibility. How about page visibility too with everything inside of it, huh? That would be a nice one to have, wouldn't it? All right, so I showed you the before, and the before worked exactly as... I programmed it to. Here's the after right now. So let me refresh out of this. Let me clear out of this right now. There we go. So this page is in Vietnamese. No, it's not. <laughs> wow, the gods are very unhappy with me right now. All right, so what I wanted to do is click out of this, click back in again. You're seeing that my times are showing up appropriately in here. Again, if I click off and click back on again, magically... Boy, magically, all right, one more browser and then we move on. Are you convinced? See how easy this is? All right, let's try this one more time here. So that's what I'm expecting. So when I move off of this tab and go anywhere else and come back in again, waiting, 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 oh my goodness, all right. Well, I will show you source code of code that didn't work. All I'm looking for right now is I'm listening on this visibility change. And right now, we have to do this kind of ugly code. And when you look at this code, you see, aha, see? See how awful web development is? We're early stage right now. Every vendor is implementing their own way to deal with these different events. But this is a short-term temporary problem. This is why jQuery is running on a mere 25 million different websites across the web. jQuery is a great example of a polymorphic library that allows you to write to the jQuery API and it abstracts away all of this nonsense going on behind the scenes. At Time Warner Cable, we wrote our own video libraries because some of the video players would be Flash, some of them would be Silverlight, some of them would be HTML5, some of them would be native to the individual device. We didn't throw up our hands and say, ah, oh, web development is hard, I hate my job because there are all these differences. We kind of pulled on our big boy pants and we said, we're programmers and we know how to deal with this. We'll write a single library and have it polymorphically bind to the browsers. So I'm showing you the ugly, ugly underpinnings right now, but this is code that you would only have to write once and it'll be solved over time as the browser manufacturers coalesce on a single solution. So this shouldn't bother anyone right now, but 
If we want to see if WebKit is hidden or Mozilla is hidden or Microsoft is hidden, eventually we'll just be able to look on document hidden. And then if they're hidden, we'll be able to go in there and write stuff out. So I'm not going to waste any more time on demos that don't work. I apologize about that. It is cool stuff. This is something that I know won't work. So how about that? Let me set your expectations early. I don't have any AirPlay devices floating around right now. But as I said, AirPlay, those Apple TVs, I can't tell you how ubiquitous they're being, becoming. Not because I want to go to work and watch videos, YouTube, Netflix, movies, on my conference room TV. Every conference room I walk into these days, whether it's a startup or it's a Fortune 500 company, they have those Apple TVs because it's a wireless, seamless way for me to throw my laptop screen onto a conference room wall. And it has the added benefit of allowing me to take my iPhone and throw it up on the wall or my tablet and throw it up on the wall. And so there is a nice AirPlay API out there that allows us to detect these things. Now, if you join me this afternoon when we're talking about smartphones and smart TVs, we'll see that AirPlay is one proprietary implementation out there. There are open source implementations, universal plug and play, DLNA, Digital Living Network Association. There's Dial. There's all kinds of different things. 